Hi there, everybody. I'm Jeff Mayers from WestPolitics.com. I want to thank you to our February 18th virtual luncheon. We usually have these at the Madison Club or maybe at the Milwaukee Press Club or somewhere in DC in person. But um, because of the pandemic, uh, we've been doing these online. So this is one that would have normally uh, taken place at the Madison Club. And uh, someday, um, hopefully by the uh, second half of the year, we'll be able to do these in person again. So I thank you for your patience on that. Um, want to talk to you a little bit before I introduce sponsors and our guests for today, talk about our upcoming events. On March 4th, we have the Democratic Legislative Leaders. On April 15th, we have a Senate Majority Leader Lemahue. And uh, we'll have a couple of Milwaukee Press Club. We do uh, events with the Milwaukee Press Club. There's two tentatively scheduled in March. Uh, one I can confirm is March 11th with Congresswoman Gwen Moore, Democrat of Milwaukee. But today, it being budget week in Wisconsin, uh, we're going to talk to the new Joint Finance Committee co-chairs, Representative Mark Bourne, a Republican from Beaver Dam, and Senator Howard Markline, a Republican from Spring Green. Uh, we uh, This event and the Madison Club events are sponsored by Hush Blackwell Strategies, Wisconsin Hospital Association, American Family Insurance, ARP Wisconsin, Walmart, and XL Energy. Thank you, sponsors. And welcome, Representative Bourne, Senator Mark Klein. How are you today? Doing well. How are you? Good day. Good to be with you. Great. And you're coming to us from the Joint Finance Committee room. It's quite empty yes. right now. It's, it's pretty <laughs> unusual compared to when, when the co-chair and I are usually here. Yeah, but soon yeah, it'll right. be our home away from home. So we thought it was a good spot. Yeah. <laughs> right. You and the Fiscal Bureau just hanging out. Yeah. Um, so uh, first of all, thank you. This has been a tradition where the uh, Joint Finance Co-Chairs come in and we talk about the budget after it's introduced by the governor. And uh, uh, you're, you're, you're unlike the uh, ones we've had for many years now. John Nygren and Alberta Darling were the uh, long-running co-chairs, uh, uh, one of the most historic uh, duos in Wisconsin history. And uh, you're taking over. So not everybody uh, may be familiar with you. Certainly, if you're a lobbyist, uh, you, know, you would have uh, they would have made contact with you over the years for sure. Uh, but you know, for a lot of our audience today, they may not uh, know you all that well. So uh, I think that my initial impression is you're both having common family farm backgrounds, and you're both uh, representing um, you know non big metro areas. And so I think you perhaps bring a different perspective than previous co-chairs. So, um, you know, why don't we just start with you, Representative Bourne, what, um, you know, what's your thinking on what the, uh, uh, the Joint Finance Committee uh, will do and your imprint on uh, how it will operate? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, as uh, Senator Markline and I have started working together on this here in the last uh, six weeks or so, and then, um, getting to know each other better. We certainly knew each other coming in and worked on bills before and been and been around the legislature a little mm -hmm. while, but this is certainly new roles for both of us. And, you know, I think we'll bring some, some new ideas, but also uh, as veteran members of the committee for both of us, you know, we had, uh, we have a lot of uh, things that work well and um, a lot of things that we know, as you mentioned, uh, you know, the prior co-chairs were here a long time and a lot of well-established things. And so, I mean, I think when you see some of the initial stuff, you know, we put out a memo recently on how the committee will run and it, it looks very much the same as, as it has run the last couple of budgets because there's, there's not a necessarily a, any sort of need to reinvent the wheel, um, but I think we'll, um, we'll have uh, certainly some, some changes along the way and some of it will be dictated by just the, you know, the current environment. We'll maybe see a couple of new things just with the, the current uh, pandemic situation and things like that. So. Uh, but otherwise, uh, I don't think you'll see a huge difference. Uh, Senator Markline, uh, you know, what about your background and how it may play into how the uh, the committee operates? Well, I'm uh, I'm a farm boy, uh, like Representative Bourne. I uh, I live uh, a mile from uh, the dairy farm that I was uh, raised on, and my background, I'm a, I'm a CPA. Uh, spent my virtually my entire career uh, with. Uh, uh, Virtual Krause Company, Baker Tilly, uh, and uh, so 
uh, some of your um, listeners may recognize that firm. So you know, I guess I've got a reasonably strong background in, in accounting and finance. Um, you know, I guess, you know, uh, like Representative Bourne, you know, this isn't my first uh, rodeo here on uh, Joint Finance Committee. And I've been through, I've been through uh, three budgets uh, already. This would be my fourth budget. Um, every budget, I think I, my, uh, my learning, my uh, experience, uh, you know, helps. Um, so I'm looking forward uh, to this in, in a different role. Uh, um, and I, um, I've appreciated the, the leadership that uh, preceded us. Uh, they did a, a great job, I think, of um, guiding the committee in the past. And, um, you know, I look forward to continuing that. And, um, you know, and I, my guess, too, is I don't know that we're going to make any uh, dramatic changes uh, in terms of process. I think it's going to be fundamentally, you know, similar with some, maybe some unique uh, challenges, uh, you know, given the, the pandemic. Okay, well, let's just hop into the news of the day. Uh, our format for this, if you're not familiar, is I ask some questions to set things up, and then we have audience questions that uh, are filtered through me, uh, those that have been submitted in advance. So uh, let's just start with the news of the day. And since it, uh, uh, the Senate was in uh, action this morning on the floor, Senator Markland, let's just go to you. Why, why this approach on the unemployment uh, uh, insurance bill um, uh, that had been introduced in special session uh, from Governor Evers? Why this approach? Well, and I'm going to uh, defer here quickly to to the uh, the co-chair because uh, this was his bill. Uh, but uh, you know that that bill uh, we passed, uh, uh, I think, it was unanimously yesterday in, yeah. in joint finance, and then uh, with a strong bipartisan vote today on the floor of the Senate. But you know it accomplishes a lot of um, what we we wanted to do. And uh, you know I've heard from many of my constituents, uh, schools. Um, you know, employers on uh, liability, the need for liability uh, protection. And so that was one of the big, big things we did here. And then, on, um, you know, it addressed the, the uh, DWD um, issues with, uh, you know, upgrading their, their systems. And I, I like the approach that the, uh, the co-chair, um, you know, used in there. And that's basically to kind of do it in steps, uh, get an RFP first, and then, um, and then we'll go from there. And uh, I think it might be a little bit different than the approach that the uh, the governor had in his budget and that some of the Democrats had proposed. Uh, you know, I don't, um, I, I know from my private sector experience, you know, if you uh, have a $80 million budget on uh, construction of your uh, building, I can guarantee you what the price is gonna come in at. And uh, it won't be much less than $80 million. So I, I appreciate the approach that the co-chair uh, used there. Let's get a let's get some information first, and then and then go from there. Okay, Representative Bourne, why don't you tell us why you this approach instead of uh, maybe just taking up the governor's bill as what uh, as it was introduced? Yeah, we we took this approach because we sh we uh, you know, a month ago already sent a letter to the governor, uh, Senator Markline, and I did saying there are other ways to do this. We don't need a big appropriation right now. You have the ability to do this on your own. There are a lot of different ways to fund this RFP. And he just refused. He, he just, it was clear. He kept saying this was important. This was a priority, but he seemed to think we could only do it one way and he wasn't willing to lead on it. And so we just came in with this different approach on trying to accomplish a similar goal and said, here you go. This is the compromise. This is how we can move forward with what you're saying is a priority. If it's really a priority, then then lead on it and here's the path. And uh, so far, I mean, I guess I'll have to admit, I didn't see what the, the Senate vote was this morning, but certainly it was it had broad support in the in the committee. And I'm assuming it got um, similar support on the Senate floor and I'm hopeful it'll get similar uh, broad bipartisan support in the assembly uh, very shortly. And uh, we can send it off to the governor then and he can move into working on this issue that he says is important. And I think you know, we heard from others that they agreed and here's a path to get it done. Right. And there's also, though, uh, just so people know if they don't, that weren't following, there's there's a lot of there's other stuff in there, not just about unemployment insurance. Right. Well, the bill had um, other things that were in AB1, uh, the the COVID bill on uh, unemployment insurance. And then it also had the uh, business liability that the senator mentioned that was a priority for, uh, you know, both caucuses and for a lot of uh, people and, and businesses throughout the state. 
So at any rate, in early going, you seem to be getting along pretty well. The the, the two houses, right? <laughs> so there far, was some, so there was some uh, speculation that that might not happen. Oh, I've yeah, I don't think we're going to have uh, at least from you know where we sit here today. I might I don't think we're going to have any issues in getting along. Um, you know, we uh, we communicate uh, frequently. Uh, we've worked yeah. together on this committee, uh, so you know I, I think you know, we know each other's styles, which I think is important. Mm -hmm. And uh, that communication is is, is uh, incredibly important. And I, I'm also happy with the level of communication uh, from our staffs. And as anybody who's been around politics know, um, the the relationships and, you know, that's where the hard work is done a lot of times is with our, our staffs. And uh, they've been getting along, I think, well. And, um, you know, so I'm, I'm optimistic about our ability to work together during this budget. I agree, and especially I would highlight the on the. I mean, how like Howard said, we we we've known each other for a while, and we certainly talk. We chatted a little bit this morning on the phone. Uh, we've chatted on weekends already on the phone. You know, right. touching base on stuff. But the staff, I mean, it, it's been good to watch. You know, certainly the first couple of weeks, everybody was trying to figure out. You know, we both had some new staff. We're trying to figure out their roles in our offices, how they interact with the the neighbor as, as we are in the you know finance ring, but now it's clear that they are interacting really well together and that's helping make our job so much easier. Well, the staff was very cooperative in setting this up. So kudos to staff. Yes, hire, so, hire, uh, good, hire good people. Yep. All right, let's jump into some issues. You know, the governor introduced a budget, a lot of big ideas, some of those introduced ahead of time. And I think the what I heard from the Republican leadership, including you folks, was dead on arrival for most of this stuff. It's it doesn't belong in the budget, or it's too big of an idea, like juvenile justice, or uh, you know, that's not gonna fly with our folks, uh, Act 10 uh, reversal. So are you going to start all over again? Do you, you are you going to do it like it did last time? Uh, you know, basically go back to base budget and then build from there, or what? What's the plan? And we haven't sat down with the team yet to make the final decision on that. But I think, as you just indicated, if you kind of look at where we're at with this budget, I mean, filled with non-fiscal, divisive policy, you know, specifically stuff that when a couple of weeks ago, again, Senator and I sent a letter to the governor saying, here's you know, here's a way we can work on a budget together. Don't include a bunch of divisive policy that doesn't belong. Don't include huge tax increases. Don't go on a massive spending spree like he did last time. And then he did all three of those things. So we are kind of in a similar spot than what we were last time, or I would say even worse, um, even higher spending, um, more taxes and, and more divisive policy like the Act 10 stuff you mentioned that's really settled law now. So I think we're clearly headed towards probably a similar approach to last time, and we'll make that you know final decision here in the next few weeks. As we've gone through, you know, preliminarily the the governor's budget, I guess I would characterize uh, his budget as a liberal's dream, and uh, that includes not just the spending side of things, but also uh, you know all of the, uh, the 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 policy items that that are in there. So um, I think it would be uh, again we haven't made that decision. Uh, as to whether we're going to start with the governor's budget or, or, or base, but you know, I it, it's going to be difficult to start with the governor's budget. Okay, I'll just uh, remind the audience that we have a, a standing invitation to the governor to uh, join us in one of these, and he did in uh, uh, when he came into office, and um, and then we have the the uh, minority leaders of the uh, of the assembly and senate coming in on March fourth for a, a rebuttal, if you will. But let me just go into these specific programs because, you know, I, you know, like recreational uh, marijuana legalization, that that's a popular thing, maybe not in your particular districts, but across the state. So why not put something popular that makes money in the budget? Well, that's a, it's a huge uh, issue, a huge topic that uh, I don't believe um, should be included uh, in the budget. I mean, I, I was just reading the the, uh, the Wall Street Journal the other day, and uh, you know they talked about even in the state of New York, uh, they're putting they want to put that in the budget because they don't believe it'll pass uh, on its own. And uh, it's a significant enough policy change that um, that topic needs to be debated in the you know the light of day on its own. Uh, you know, we've heard from I've heard from 
my sheriffs, my healthcare professionals, social workers. Uh, we've heard from um, uh, representatives in, in uh, legislators in Colorado uh, on this topic. And it's a big policy sh shift. And I, I just believe it's too big to be inserted uh, into the state budget. Could you yeah, uh, go ahead, Representative Borden? No, I just say I would agree with that, and I've made the same statements already. I mean, that's kind of what I said earlier about the big policy items. You know, this is a, a major thing that has a lot of stakeholder groups on both sides, and you know, the senator just mentioned some of them. And so, we need to have this. Uh, you know, obviously, we do public hearings on the budget, but they are on a lot of issues, and and they're and they're time limited because of how many things we have to dive into. These are big, broad discussions, and. And this is just one example of many of them that the governor put into this budget where it doesn't belong. All right, well, uh, while I'm with you, Representative Bourne, you, you know, you have a corrections background. You were part of the juvenile justice restructure and the governor wants to try it again. I think your answer to that was, that's another one that doesn't belong in the budget, even though it, it seems to have a lot of fiscal implications. It does have a few, but it's again, so big, so broad. And this is, a, I think, an even better example of this type of policy stuff that does not belong in a budget where we have had bipartisan support and a good bipartisan group working on this with two governors now. I've been in you know, large bipartisan meetings with both Governor Walker's team and Governor Evers' team in the last three, four years on this topic. We have made um, changes and improvements. And while there is certainly opportunity for you know, more work and more improvement and other things that need to be addressed in it, um, to just have uh, the governor basically make a complete reversal. I mean, I was in meetings, like I said, with members from the other side of the aisle and the governor's team and DOA and the Department of Corrections uh, when this governor came into office and his focus was on building type one facilities and, and things. And now in a complete flip-flop, no type ones in a whole different direction and no discussion, even with other members in his own caucus from in the legislature who have approached me in recent weeks about this issue uh, in much the same way we've worked on it before and weren't talking about many of these things that he's now put in this budget. So it's, it's clear this needs a lot more discussion in the light of day and, and committee work and hopefully more uh, bipartisan work like we've had in the past. Okay, so let me move on to, uh, I'm trying to hit some of these big points, you know, that, that, that are uh, the lightning rods in this budget. Uh, you know, the other one is expansion of Medicaid. This is a repeat of what happened two years ago. Uh, Republicans uh, rejected the expansion of Me Medicaid. Now Wisconsin's one of 12 states. It looks like the feds want to sweeten the pot to convince people to uh, expand Medicaid. Uh, uh, other states, these uh, 12 states, Wisconsin being among them. When's it become too good of a deal to pass up, Senator Markline? Well, again, we haven't uh, had a chance to, to talk in, uh, you know, in our caucus on this, and that's, you know, will be, I'm sure, a conversation we'll have um, down the road. But, uh, you know, I think as we have uh, talked about in the past, I mean, we always look at the, the uh, all the consequences of, of that decision, and that includes, uh, you know, we've got roughly forty thousand people around private uh, insurance that would be kicked off their private insurance and on the, the, the Medicaid rolls. And that has consequences, obviously, for um, providers uh, and, and for, the, for those people that are um, shifting from you know, private insurance onto the, the, uh, the uh, Medicaid roll. So um, it's not as, you know, sometimes I think in the, uh, it's been characterized as this simple decision in the, in, the, in the media. And I don't, you know, it's not as simple as what uh, some people think. So I guess that's, the, yeah, and I agree. And I'm sorry if I, uh, <laughs> my question relays simplicity, but sometimes I have to do that. But <laughs> but what you're saying is access to healthcare in Wisconsin, uh, there are, um, it's adequate. It, you don't need to expand Medicaid to capture the uninsured or, uh, or there are other ways to do it. You know, I believe so. We've got, you know, we do a great job in this state of covering uh, our residents and, or, and providing opportunities for them uh, to be covered uh, in insurance. So, you know, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the, the expansion, the Medicaid expansion, uh, you know, is one uh, alternative, but uh, the problem in our state is not nearly as significant as what um, it is in some other states. Some other states didn't have the 
the, 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 the net that we have had for, for many, many years here. All right, let me move on to K through 12 um, funding. The governor being a former state school superintendent um, has been pro-education funding. He, his budget proposes getting back to two thirds. I think from my memory banks, when I was covering the legislature, that was a Tommy Thompson thing, two thirds funding for schools as part of a way to uh, contain property taxes. Uh, should we get back to two thirds funding of schools? Uh, Representative Bourne. Yeah, I think this is, you know, the education issue is always a major one and we'll have broad caucus discussions on that. So we haven't had any of those discussions yet on specific goals or targets, but um, we have uh, worked towards that uh, the last couple of budgets and the assembly caucus. We've made, you know, we've put more money in education every budget that I've been here. And so I think, you know, that certainly will be a priority for the caucus. But as far as like specific goals at this point, it, it's kind of a, uh, you know, premature, at least for, for me to comment on a specific goal for education, but we'll certainly, uh, it'll be a major issue and a major part of, of uh, assembly Republican discussions, certainly. Well, certainly there's a lot of ways to divvy up 1.6 billion, but uh, anyway, what, what about you, Senator Mark? What do you think of K through 12 uh, spending level, uh, two thirds funding? Well, um, you know, again, we haven't uh, caucused either on, on the whole K-12, you know, funding level. I, I can tell you, you know, in the last uh, week here, you know, we've, um, uh, well, not the week, but, uh, you know, we've, this, our schools will receive in federal money over a billion dollars of, of federal money here um, very, very shortly. And uh, I know one thing that we, uh, we voted on uh, recently was uh, funding um, for our schools that, that are open. And, uh, you know, I believe strongly that we need to get our kids uh, back in school. And uh, so, you know, and while we haven't, um, you know, talked about any, you know, specifics in our, in our caucus on uh, K-12 funding, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, um, the idea of providing incentives or whatever for our kids to be back in school is going to be something that um, we may be considering. Yeah, you know, the budget is uh, uh, gets a little confusing in or fun, state funding because Governor Evers was able to distribute in 2020 about $2 billion in federal money. And you folks had little or no say in that. Um, so is that, I, am I hearing a little frustration about that from, from your end? Well, it's, it's the law. I mean, you know, we, we had no oversight. Uh, it's just the way it is. I guess we can be, uh, be frustrated, but unfortunately it's the way the, the, the law is at this point. So, but, you know, I mean, it's $2 billion uh, dropped into, you know, our state budgets uh, is not an insignificant amount of money. And, uh, you know, and, and there's, I think a couple hundred million that's of that that hasn't been uh, spent yet. So, um, you know, at some point in time, you know, during the, the budget process, I think we're going to want to know, you know, um, what impact that that federal money has had on the various agencies. Right, or new federal money that may be coming from the uh, late December bill and maybe a new one. Right. Absolutely. No, I mean, it's a, you know, it's a lot of money uh, that, that has come in and, and will come in. So you're not saying uh, it was misspent or anything. You're just saying you want to know where it went and what, what the implications are for the state budget. Yes. And that, that information is important. And with the, the lack of oversight, like you, you started in the question, I mean, that's a, that's a problem. We don't know where all this is going. We don't know where it's all gone and how it impacts all the state budget. So that's a lot of information we're trying to gather. And that's why we included in AB1 some legislative oversight of, of future federal dollars and, you know, why we wish that, uh, you know, Governor Evers would accept that approach like Governor Doyle did back in 2009 with the legislature at that time in the federal money and, and they worked more in, in partnership with that and, and we think it's important for the legislature to have the, you know, kind of talk about the power of the purse usually for a, a legislative body in our system of government and so uh, it would be uh, certainly better if we were more involved in working with the governor on that but unfortunately as the senator said that's not the federal law right now on these things and and he has not been willing to to bring us to the table on this at this point 
we've raised the uh, the issue, the question with uh, fiscal bureau on, on more than one occasion, asking about how some of this money has ended up in agencies. Where has it gone? And and our fiscal bureau has not been able to um, find out the answers to that either. And that uh, you know, at some point in time here, relatively soon, we hopefully will be able to get some answers to how some of this federal money has been allocated. Okay, uh, now while we're, uh, I want to just ask a couple questions about UW system. So uh, one thing that caught my eye in the proposal from Governor Evers was, um, I think, granting uh, Tommy Thompson's wish about bonding, the bonding power. Should UW system have power to bond on its own? I think that this is that's going to be one of those things because it is something that's new and there's certainly a variety of opinions on it in the caucus from the last couple of years where it just kind of first brought forward the idea of that. You know, we're going to have to have some caucus discussions on that. I think that um, uh, they make some good arguments, especially on the short term stuff of why we should have a serious conversation about that. But I know that there are a variety of opinions on that in my caucus. I'm guessing the senator's caucus is the same. So we're going to have to work through those things and have that discussion. And that's certainly something that uh, President Thompson and Chancellor Blank are aware of as we've started having those discussions. They know that um, they need to, uh, you know, talk with legislators and, and help them understand, you know, what the ask is and the purpose for it. And, and then we'll have to have those caucus discussions. So let me ask the accountant, isn't this the best time ever to borrow money? Yeah, but you know, the, the problem with borrowing, I've learned in my career is you have to pay it back. And so, you know, I, uh, again, I, um, you know, I'm open to listening to the arguments for, for bonding and all that. But, uh, um, you know, I, I think, you know, in our caucus, uh, we have to have a serious conversation about that before we give the UW system a credit card. Okay. I think there's a, I would categorize that as skeptical. Okay, so here's something else that's related, I think, to the UW system budget. You know, the budget uh, is the biggest uh, bill that passes each year. It contains all kinds of things that touches every Wisconsinite. In there, though, is both the tech colleges and the systems. And, uh, you know, you folks have those uh, institutions in your districts so or certainly nearby. There's talk about combining, you know, the the local tech school with the local uh, system campus. I, is that something that could be approached in uh, this budget? I, we haven't talked about it at all in our, in our caucus, so I don't know that I have any 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 strong opinion on that, um, you know, um, at this point. That's also something that would be a pretty major, you know, change initiative. Uh, I don't know that this budget would be ready for you know anything like that i think it's something that uh, certainly you know president thompson singled uh, that we should start talking about and i don't think that there would be legislators that would be uncomfortable with talking about it but it seems like a pretty major initiative to be um putting into any in budget including this budget okay well the good news is you have a lot of money to uh at hand right i mean the how big is the surplus and uh, and the and the rainy day fund and um, how how does that make your jobs easier or harder I guess yeah we've certainly put ourselves in a good fiscal position with the policies that we've been you know pushing the last several budgets here in the Republican legislature and to have the largest rainy day fund in history and a and a good surplus and certainly as the senator and I have talked about before when when these numbers came out and the most recent estimates from the fiscal bureau, uh, you know, the policies have put us in a good position and it helped us come through a national pandemic uh, in a lot better shape uh, than we uh, thought we would be. Uh, I think, and most people thought we would be, you know, a much better shape financially. So I think I'll leave it at that and let the accountant talk about the, uh, the numbers. You know, um, when I got elected, uh, first got elected back in 2010, um, on the, uh, our financial position in the state had de deteriorated incredibly. We, on, a, on the basis of generally accepted accounting principles, gap that most of our, you know, school districts and counties and businesses uh, keep their books on, on the basis of gap, we had a $3 billion hole when I got elected back in 2010. It took us a decade 
But we ended uh, the year on June 30th, 2020 in, in, the, in the positive, okay? Uh, and, you know, we worked hard. To, we worked hard to get us to that point. Uh, we knew when we started way back when we weren't gonna turn that um, ship around overnight. And uh, it took, you know, strong um, fiscal discipline over the last year, uh, over the, the legislatures, uh, the prior um, co-chairs. And uh, you know what's to me kind of sad is, is that uh, the, the governor's budget, if we'd adopt his budget uh, as is, we would have a, um, a billion dollar deficit at the end of the, uh, of the year, at uh, the end of the biennium, okay? And uh, that, that disturbs me. You know, again, we've worked hard to put us in the, the financial position that we're in. And uh, it's a whole lot easier to uh, fund the needs of our, uh, constituents, you know, the needs of our uh, state government when we have the resources to do it. So, uh, you know, I'm hopeful that we can, you know, um, not, you know, not blow through the, the cash balances and the rainy day fund that we've worked so hard to, uh, to get in the last few years. Okay, that number you said a billion dollars, is that a gap number at the end of 20, uh, mid 23? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yep. Okay, so what is our surplus, not accounting the rainy day fund? 1.8. Yeah, I mean, the, the last the numbers we had 1.8. Um, you know, the governor did uh, uh, sign, I think, as we're speaking here, signing the, uh, the, the tax bill uh, that we um, passed uh, recently. So, you know, that'll come down uh, a bit from uh, those, those tax cuts with the PPP. So, but, um, you know, we're, we're going into this budget process from a strong financial position. All right, so is there anything you like in the governor's budget? I mean, Met with a, silence? Or, come on. Well, no, there's there's certainly, I mean, there's, our caucuses have, have supported broadband. I'm sure we will again. Will it be exactly the plan the governor put forward? Probably not, but we'll continue to support broadband. There's, you know, the Assembly Republican Caucus, especially last time, and the Senate joined us with this, of course, and to get it into the budget, but uh, we were really focused on the nursing homes and you know, folks that are taking care of our most vulnerable. So we made major investments in the last budget on that. The governor has some of that in this budget. And so I'm sure we'll, we'll do some of those things again. Um, and even like we talked about education earlier, you know, that's always a priority for our caucuses. Are we going to spend at the levels he is? Of course not. We didn't last time either, but we'll, we'll still make good investments mm -hmm. in those areas. And so, yeah, there's, there's areas to work. And that's why when we sent that letter, you know, we pointed to that. It's like, don't do all this divisive stuff. Let's work on issues that are important to the families and, and businesses in Wisconsin, like education, transportation, healthcare. There's, there's things we can focus on. Broadband is certainly one. Yeah, yeah I would agree with uh, co-chair Bourne. You know, the um, broadband obviously has, has been one of my um, priorities, you know, for the last uh, six years or so. And, and I, it'll be a priority uh, this budget and into the future. So, you know, um, how we fund it, you know, that, that's something we have to, uh, have to uh, debate, uh, agriculture, you know, uh, there's a, uh, the governor's proposed some, um, you know, funding for, uh, agricultural programs. And I think that, you know, many of those, uh, may have, uh, have some merit, um, you know, like with the, the, uh, farmer, the egg, uh, suggestions, you know, uh, what I will be doing uh, between now and the time we pass anything for agriculture is I'll be talking to my farmers to see what makes sense to them. Um, you know, sometimes programs and policies sound great, you know, sitting here in, in Madison, but, uh, you know, when I go out and talk to my, uh, my, my farmers, uh, they don't make quite as much sense out there. So um, K-12 schools, obviously, you know, our kids are important. Uh, um, as I mentioned earlier, I, you know, I, I want to see those kids uh, in school. You know, we've talked about that uh, here on joint finance and the importance of that. Okay, we're going to go to some audience questions. I would say the, the biggest audience question is what about public hearings and how can people participate virtually? Do you have any plan for how that will uh, occur? We haven't finalized the plan, but I, I think that uh, the, you know, my guess is uh, we'll have a similar number of um, public hearings around the state like we've had uh, in the past. And obviously there's some logistical challenges this year with COVID. Uh, we haven't really come to any decision yet in terms of the number and locations and all that. And but we are also exploring um, you know, some virtual options this year for people to uh, share their opinions uh, 
with the Joint Finance Committee. Yep. Yeah, so there will be a virtual component of some sort for, for people. Well, and there has always, at least as long as I've been in the committee, there's always been options for, there's usually an email, there's some web stuff. So there's always other ways to interact with the committee besides the public hearings. And But I think that we are also talking about, are there ways that we can improve those, you know, bolster those, increase those, because we realize that people are going to want a variety of ways to reach out to the committee. And what's the timeline, Ed? You, you know, the, uh, since Republicans have been in control of the legislature, sometimes that budget even passes before July 1. What's your hope? Yeah, I think we'll look at a similar timeline. And, and, and you know, we're certainly, we're on schedule at this point, and we hope to continue <laughs> to, you know, proceed along those lines. And, uh, you know, so we'll, the fiscal bureau is obviously doing their work now, as they always do on the governor's budget, and we give them uh, several weeks to do that. But then, uh, you know, we'll get into our agency uh, conversations and uh, the public hearings and the different ways for the public to have input, like we just talked about, and and into our executive sessions, and uh, you know, be done and hopefully uh, enjoy a good summer. Then, as long as we stay on schedule, I'm hoping we'll have we'll be done by July 1st. Yep, that's a good goal. People can maybe go relax outside on July 4th. Then, <laughs> so. Um, I, I, here's another question from the audience. I'm going to run through some audience questions and I'm, uh, some of these audience I will have to rephrase because I'm combining them with other similar questions. But there's a lot of talk about the minimum wage, both at the federal level, $15 minimum wage, uh, the Biden administration uh, has been pushing, but it's um, encountered some problems. Uh, Governor Evers is proposing a, a, a increase in the state minimum wage. Um, what's your view on a minimum wage increase um, and to what level? Well, I, I think the minimum wage conversation, uh, again, that should be, you know, a separate conversation. I don't think that should be uh, in, in the budget. That's a pretty significant uh, policy change. And, you know, um, I'm always concerned about um, when we talk about raising the minimum wage, who, who, who is hurt? And it tends to be the, the people on the lowest end of the economic spectrum. And I can tell you from, again, my work in the private sector, when, um, you know, w when wages at the low end get, uh, get too high, um, companies automate and uh, those jobs are, are gone then. And I know I didn't start at, at 20 bucks an hour. You know, I started at, I think it was 90 cents an hour, maybe it's less than that, in fact you know, way back when, and it was an entry level job, my first job off the farm. And, and, uh, you know, I, so uh, I'm just very, very cautious always about, you know, what the impact is going to be to the, to the people that are on the lowest end of the uh, economic spectrum, if we talk about increases. And the, I think there was a report released uh, recently, a national report that talked about, you know, what happens uh, in the, in the country, if we, we go to 15 dollars an hour and i think they were talking about a 900,000 lost jobs in the in the country so uh you know the, the economists recognize that there uh, there's a cost uh and uh, it hits the, the lowest uh, uh wage earners the most yeah i think that was a cbo report about it, it had a double barreled uh conclusion it, it would fewer people would have jobs but then it would also lift uh, uh, a, a significant percentage of people out of poverty. So uh, I guess it depends on, uh, you know, what business, where it is, uh, what populations. Mm -hmm. So that's not something that you guys want to uh, do at the joint finance level. I think it's unlikely you would see anything like that in this budget, certainly. Okay. Uh, here's another uh, question. Um, are there any plans to eliminate the remaining parts of the personal property tax? Well, I, you know, that's been one of my uh, pr priorities too, is, uh, you know, eliminating the, the personal property tax. It's a, uh, the personal property tax, the history in that goes, you know, way back to long before we had even had an income tax uh, and long before we had a sales tax in this state. Uh, it's a, uh, uh, it's a it's a, a tax where um, businesses have to pay um, to have people ca calculate the the tax. Um, again, as CPAs, we did thousands and thousands of those personal property tax reports, and uh, I would love to to uh, be able to afford to eliminate that at, at some point in time. 
um, that'll be, a, 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 again, a conversation like many of these will have to be um, conducted in the context of the budget as a whole and, and uh, can we afford it? Um, so. It's also something we have to question our, if whether or not this is something the governor is willing to work with us on too. And that's you know certainly part of the equation in that conversation. And, but uh, certainly there's a lot of support for it in our assembly Republican caucus. And so I'm sure it will be uh, heavily discussed. Okay, here's a uh, related to, uh, this is a property tax related question, you know, a homeowner property tax related question. Will you propose an increase or would you support an increase in revenue limits for local public school districts? I think that, uh, you know, we haven't had any caucus discussions on specific issues like this, but at least historically, um, our caucus has not been supportive of things that will increase property taxes. Uh, this governor's budget is, is going to raise properties taxes a lot. Um, and so we're not usually looking for, for things that are going to put a greater burden on uh, homeowners and especially our, you know, our seniors on fixed incomes and stuff trying to maintain their properties in Wisconsin. One of the uh, most hated taxes I believe in Wisconsin is the property tax. It comes at, you get one, you know, uh, one bill for it. People know exactly what it is. And uh, so it, it, it's an unpopular tax. And you know, if local school districts, uh, communities want to increase their uh, property tax, they can do it. You know, they can do it via referendum. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, that's a little you know more challenging conversation for locals. You know, because they have to go to their uh, their voters to get approval to to raise their taxes. Well, in essence, that has happened quite a bit. Uh, people have essentially voted to tax themselves for specific programs, buildings, or whatever in their school districts. Uh, the governor's also uh, uh, proposed uh, letting uh, municipalities and counties do uh, something similar with the sales tax. Is that something that could fly? I've got concerns about that and, and we have not talked about this at all uh, with my caucus uh, so this is my just my personal opinion you know I, I represent a as you stated earlier very rural part of the state and uh, you know I've got counties that have uh, very very little retail base um, the governor's proposal is great for the city of Madison it's great for Dane County um, when I look at a, a county like uh, Lafayette County in, in my district, where they've got virtually no retail base, um, you know, they're, they're not going to benefit. My townships are not going to benefit from that proposal. And so, you know, I'm very concerned that that policy decision would, um, you know, make the richer, rich, richer and, and our poorer, poorer and uh, increase the disparity between our, our wealthier counties in this state and our poorer counties. Anything to add on that, Representative Bourne? I, I would just say that, you know, we've had some bills before in the legislature that looked at uh, referendums for half percent sales tax for transportation at the county level. And I think that something like that is a lot different than what the governor is proposing here. He's proposing just, you know, to let them go to referendum to increase the taxes and really not have any strings, you know, any any rules, any, any guide rails, anything to control where that spending is going. Um, there's nothing to say that it's really going to, you know, have any sort of positive impact on property taxes in any way. And, uh, you know, senators write about how it'll impact different communities, different ways. So I think it was, it would be one thing if we were talking about something that was very uh, targeted. Um, and even then there would be differences of opinion, certainly in the caucuses. Like I said, we've had those bills in the past, they haven't moved forward, but there's certainly been support for them. So I think those type of conversations will go forward, but the suggestion that the governor's put in there, I really don't see uh, having a lot of support. All right, here's one, uh, I, um, this, this might be a lobbyist for a nursing home providers, but anyway, uh, I'll just read it to you. Nursing home providers lose $70 per day on every Medicaid resident they serve, and there is significant Medicaid uh, fund surplus. So could that money, that surplus be used to help nursing home providers? Well, I'm certainly, you know, supportive of, of, of our, our nursing homes. You know, they provide care for our uh, most vulnerable. Um, my wife is a nurse who worked probably 25 years or better in, in nursing homes, you know, so I've, I've got a 
soft spot in my heart uh, for our nursing home. So, you know, as far as raising, uh, you know, the rates, um, you know, I guess, uh, you know, again, that's going to be a conversation that we're going to have to have uh, in the in the budget process. Yeah, I would agree. It's part of the budget conversation. I mean, there are a lot of, uh, you know, parts of that program that'll be part of a budget conversation. And I would also, you know, we need to see uh, where we're at. I mean, the, today's surplus might not be tomorrow's surplus once we get into this budget and start looking at what the projections are moving forward and stuff. So um, I don't know that I would be so focused on any particular surplus today, but rather on just, you know, what the, the priorities can be as we decide how to you know, prioritize spending on things that are important to the state of Wisconsin. Yeah, with or without Medicaid expansion, the Medicaid budget is is a huge element of what uh, the finance committee looks at every year. And, um, and I, you know, I, I think it seems to be unclear exactly what the pandemic uh, effect on Medicaid numbers are. Is there any sort of hint uh, about what the pandemic has, how it's affected the Medicaid budget numbers? Well, because of the enhanced reimbursement from, from the federal government, it's, it's actually uh, helped us uh, in Wisconsin. So, you know, that's why, you know, we're in, uh, in good shape. And I, I think the, the federal enhancement uh, is uh, reimbursement ends, uh, I believe, near the end of March. Uh, I might be off on that. Of course, I'm not sure what the any new legislation in Washington uh, will do to, uh, as far as extending that enhanced uh, reimbursement. But, um, you know, I, I would have guessed a year ago that, you know, our account would not have been in as good a position as it is uh, today. I, I think that's, only, uh, that's a short, that could be a short term thing is what you're saying. Right. It just depends on how long the feds continue to do some of that enhanced funding. And also, I think the administration is projecting some increases in the numbers of folks enrolled, uh, but I'm not sure. I haven't really dove into that too far yet. Right. I, I get that. Okay. Now here's a, a there's a couple of questions on transportation funding. Uh, so uh, there, in the past, uh, the states actually, uh, you know, borrowed from the general fund, uh, you know, for the transportation fund. Um, you know, what's your sense for how transportation funding will fare in the upcoming budget? And we haven't had caucus discussions on this yet either, of course, and I don't know that we're going to be able to say how we're going to fund, you know, today, <laughs> what pots we're going to take for funding of transportation, but I think it'll continue to be a priority in our caucuses. And I certainly think that, um, I think certainly Senator Markline and I come from a similar viewpoint on this. I know he led on this issue last time. Uh, uh, local roads will be a priority and we know the popularity of that uh, program that we did last time. And so I'm sure there will be interest in the, our caucus and probably the Senate uh, caucus too. And, and uh, you know, trying to find ways to continue to uh, provide more resources, especially for our local roads. As an aside, do you support uh, the uh, reinvigoration, I guess you would say, of the Transportation Commission? I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, does it matter what they what the commission says about we, this project versus the other projects? Well, you know, I think uh, are you talking about the 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 TPC, the Transportation Projects Commission? Yeah. It uh, ultimately, though, there are recommendations that the legislature, you know, needs to make in terms of enumeration and, and all that. So, um, you know, I, I've attended those meetings. Uh, you know, so far, you know, the uh, recommendations have made some sense, um, but uh, ultimately it's up to the legislature in terms of what we're going to uh, fund in the future. But when I, how I read your philosophy is m local roads instead of mega projects, road maintenance locally instead of building new stuff. Is that basically it? I don't know that I would say that that's a philosophy. I would say that our, our caucuses definitely have had interest in supporting local roads, but I wouldn't say that there's a disinterest in, you know, making sure that our backbone system is strong either. And so obviously we've also invested in major projects on 94 and I-39 and things like that. And we'll continue to, you know, prioritize those projects too. Okay. So it's not one or the other. It, it's, it, it, you can do both. Sure. That's what we have been. And I think we'll continue to focus on what, what's most important at the time. All right, here's a question on the tuition freeze. 
uh, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about the tuition freeze. I guess the question is, uh, the tuition freeze here to stay in this budget, but maybe not future budgets. Is that basically where you're going? I think we'll just have to have a caucus discussion because I know, I mean, I know that I have members that have bills to, you know, end the freeze uh, last session uh, and, and, and approach it in different ways. And I certainly have members that are very um, passionate about the freeze. And uh, so uh, we'll, ha we'll certainly have to have a caucus discussion on that. I, you know, I was one of the uh, people that uh, worked uh, back in, I think it was 2013, and we looked at the cash balances uh, at the UW system in the tuition accounts. And so, um, you know, and I, cer I certainly supported, you know, tuition freezes in the, in the past. I, you know, again, we have not talked about that as a, as a caucus at all. Um, and I, I, I suspect there's going to be a broad range of opinions uh, in our caucus on, on the tuition. All right, there's a question here on mental health uh, services. Certainly the pandemic has highlighted those and the governor's budget has uh, several um, proposals uh, to enhance mental health, including I think in the ag uh, package uh, that you mentioned, Senator Mark Vine. What's, uh, uh, I think the budget, uh, I mean, what's your viewpoint in, in terms of enhancing mental health services or funding for mental health services? Oh, I'm, you know, supportive of, of uh, and sensitive to, you know, the mental health concerns of not just farmers, but, uh, but everybody. And, um, you know, one of the issues I think we have, especially in our rural areas, is uh, who is going to provide those services? Because, you know, we don't, well, sometimes it's not a matter of just putting money in there. It's in our area, who are the, the psychiatrists and psychologists out, you know, that are going to provide those services out there? So, and uh, also, I guess I, I, I've heard from um, one of the representatives in, in my district, Representative Trannell, who's a, a farmer uh, who's talked, you know, in the past about, you know, farmer mental health uh, can be addressed pretty quickly by having a strong, uh, strong economy for our farmers. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it's the stresses and stuff that have been put on our, our farmers over the last number of years that uh, has caused a lot of those farmer mental health concerns. So um, our farmers, for the most part, had a pretty good year last year. So hopefully um, that, you know, minimizes somewhat some of the, the, the stress, the mental stress that our farmers have uh, faced in recent years. I'm sure mental health will be a priority in our caucus too. It has been for several sessions since we had a special committee on that. And, uh, you know, it's just about, um, you know, how much investment can we afford in this particular budget? I think we've been building on it the last couple of budgets. And certainly one area of focus has been mental health in schools. And I'm sure that we'll want to continue to, to build on um, those uh, grant programs that we started two budgets ago and, and built more on last time. And, and again, and we also know, as, as Senator Marklines mentioned, I think twice already about getting kids back in school. Um, we know that a huge part of helping the mental health of our kids in Wisconsin is to get them back in in-person instruction. And so that's certainly part of it too. And this also goes to uh, telehealth too, I, it just in terms of delivering the service. If you have better broadband, people can actually then use telehealth if they need to access some of these services that they can access in a rural part of the state. Is that, uh, is that a part of sounds the reason good. to expand broadband, right? Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, should, we I write the, should I write that amendment or <laughs> should I write that amendment up or what? Uh, One thing that, uh, you know, uh, the COVID uh, situation did was, you know, it accentuated, uh, it made, it made the case that I think rural legislators have been trying to make for a long time about mm -hmm. the need for, for uh, rural broadband, you know, and we see it, uh, you know, uh, not, you know, just with um, telehealth, but with uh, our, uh, with our kids, you know, that are learning virtually, you know, and, and lack of uh, access for the those kids. And then, and also just uh, people that um, their employers may have forced them to work uh, from home. And uh, so, um, you know, it's a heck of a way to have to learn uh, a lesson, but I hopefully some of our uh, legislators in some of the urban areas will be more sensitive to uh, the issues that we face in rural Wisconsin. All right, there's several questions on bipartisanship. I think that everybody, 
uh, thinks that uh, bipartisanship is a good thing in principle. Um, and then, but it, that has, uh, there's been a lot of potholes, I think, in the, in the first couple of years of, uh, of this administration. So where do you see the, this is a question, I'm just gonna quote it directly. Where do you see the greatest opportunities to compromise with the governor? I think it's on some of the things we mentioned already. There are certainly things in the budget that, you know, that we can be supportive of or that we've worked on, you know, the senators led on broadband stuff and, and we've invested as a legislature in that. And that's, you know, a highlight of his budget. So it's certainly an area where we can work together on. I think just generally too, that, you know, obviously the, whenever there's a fight or there's a veto or something, that's, that's the, the big story and all the attention, but even last session, the majority of the bills that were signed, you know, passed and signed into the law were still bipartisan bills, the vast majority. And every, every session we've been here, it's always 90 some percent. And so there's there's still a lot of bipartisan things that go on. There'll be opportunities in, in this budget um, to, to do that as well. You know, opportunities to do it in our first full meeting of, with the Joint Finance Committee yesterday with, you know, moving forward that UI bill, 15-0. Uh, so there, there'll be plenty of opportunities for that, I'm sure, in this legislative session, as well as in the budget. While we were sitting here, um, I believe the governor signed two of my bills, you know, the, the tax bills. So, I mean, there's a case where, obviously, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, we got to a point where uh, on those bills that the governor uh, was, was willing to sign, uh, good policy, uh, good for, uh, good for the state of Wisconsin. So, uh, and I think at a, like at a committee level, you know, um, not just Joint Finance Committee, but um, other committees, there's a lot more bipartisanship uh, that goes on than probably you hear in the media. You know, um, I, I know uh, Senator Erpenbach, for example, uh, you know, he and I talk uh, sometimes uh, offline about things and, uh, you know, and that that's good. That that's uh, that that's good. It helps. Uh, that's why we have unanimous votes, uh, I believe, on some of these things. So uh, you know, there, there's more of it. Um, you know, if we agree, uh, if we pass something unanimously out of Joint Finance Committee, I guarantee you, it's not going to be a headline. You know, at some <laughs> place. You know, uh, you know, it, it's the uh, it's the veto and those kinds of things that uh, attract the the media attention. Well, the governor did sign the Republican budget. I mean, he issued vetoes, but he signed a large portion of the Republican budget. Yep. Last time. All right. Well, we've come to the end. Uh, thank you for uh, sitting in with us. Really appreciate it. Uh, welcome you to the, uh, the uh, top spots there at the Joint Finance Committee. You're looking good there in your chairs. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, thank you for being with us. And I want to thank our sponsors for this event. Uh, couldn't have done it without you. Want to uh, uh, talk about, uh, yeah, so let's talk about the sponsors right now. The Wisconsin Hospital Association, XL Energy, American Family Insurance, ARP Wisconsin, Walmart, and Hush Blackwell Strategies. Uh, upcoming events, March 4th, we have the Democratic Leaders uh, on April 15th. We have uh, Senate Majority Leader Lemihu, and on March 11th, we have uh, Mil uh, Milwaukee Congresswoman Gwen Moore. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in. This is Jeff Maris from WISPolitics.com signing off. Thank you, Representative Bourne and Senator Markline. Thank you. Thank you.